Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Brave Church. How are you guys doing? Woo! Woo! You guys are awake. Let's go. Hey, uh, before we jump into a couple things, first, um, I just want to say on behalf of my family, for those that have, have reached out, it, it, we haven't been super public about it online, but my grandpa, who I talked about a few weeks ago, uh, passed away on Thursday. And so he's my dad's dad, uh, Pastor Darren's dad. And I just want to say thank you for your, your prayers, support. It means so much to us. Uh, but then also just wanted to talk about Easter Fest coming up. So we went public with our Easter Fest promotion this week. How many of you guys saw that? Yeah? I've been getting served ads, so <laughs> word must be getting out. But um, we put one of these on every seat. You can use this to spread the word, remind people. But, you know, I also just wanted to share the heart behind something. We're, we're asking people to get tickets to come to Easter Fest. And you might be like, well, why do I need a ticket to come to my church? Right? If you, you know, if you're new around here too, you might, it might be something to get used to. But one of the reasons we do this, the main reason we do this, is because it allows us to serve people better, to be more prepared with parking, with kids' ministry, and chairs, and all this stuff. And really, there's a lot of people that come to church on Easter for the first time, or just they come once or twice a year, and that's it. And so we want them to come back, right? And we want them to have a good experience. We also just view this as a huge outreach Sunday. Last year, over 2,000 people came to Easter services just here in the East Bay. So please help us spread the word. We're believing God's going to use Easter Sunday uh, to, to really be a catalytic moment in people's lives and in their faith. So let's pray before we jump into God's word today. If you join me, let's pray. God, I pray uh, that you would really use an invitation as only you can, an invitation to know you, to experience your presence. God, we are praying and believing, um, not because we just like crowds, though we love a party, but God, we pray that you would use these Easter services in a special way that changes lives, that changes the spiritual climate here in the Bay Area, and that changes families for future generations. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, hey, Today we're up, we're picking back up in John chapter 13, you can take out your notes. Uh, we actually put these, so we're trying something new, we put these on every seat, it's, uh, it's like, oh, we're going back in time, like we went fully digital during the pandemic and now we're bringing back some paper, uh, but really this is just a great way to retain more, to, uh, to, it makes it easier to remember what you're learning, and so you can follow along in the notes. And if you need a pen, just raise your hand and our ushers will get one of those to you. Also want to welcome everyone in Dublin, San Ramon, online. Let's do this. The title of this teaching is Reach for Your Greatness. Who wants to be great? Yeah? It's okay to want to be great, right? So we want to be great. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're great. I don't know you, but you're great. When accepting the first Dr. Dre Global Impact Grammy Award, Dr. Dre said this. He said, what I love about this award is that it uses my name to inspire the next generation of producers, artists, and entrepreneurs to reach for their greatness and demand that from everybody around you. Greatness is inspiring. Greatness is exciting. I love reading about great people. I love learning about people who lived great lives. And just like great artists, entrepreneurs, great people, Jesus believed that everybody can be great. Jesus taught that everyone has the potential for greatness, but not like everyone has the same idea about what the path to greatness looks like. There's a lot of different viewpoints. And so in today's passage, we see one of the most unique moments between Jesus and his disciples where Jesus does something that they don't see coming, that they don't expect. He models for them what greatness looks like, but he also does something more. He actually shows them the kind of greatness that he expects from them and the kind of greatness that he expects from us. In verse one, Jesus is about to begin his journey to the cross And that's where this story begins. It was just before Passover, the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now let's pause there for a minute. This is really important to understand the significance of what happens next. 
we have to notice what happens in verse three. It says that the father had put all things under his power. Jesus has all power. He has authority. He's in charge. He can do whatever he wants. And the first thing that Jesus chooses to do, verse four, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped the towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. The first thing Jesus does when he's been given all power and all authority is he uses that to wash his disciples' feet. And they didn't get it. They didn't know what was going on. This was like not what you would expect in their culture. Nobody should have understood what was going on. This is like weird. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are are you gonna wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my my head as well. Like Peter got a little carried away, (laughs) right? And so then Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Jesus was the greatest leader of all time and he led differently than anyone had led up to this point. He showed us how being a wise teacher, a compassionate Lord, while also being a servant of all was the path to greatness. In, a cult, in culture, we see leadership as a, a means of self-development, like a skill we can develop, like something that will help us achieve more at work or get promoted. It's a category in every bookstore. There is an entire industry built around leadership development. Great companies do leadership development to be more successful. And I love to study leadership, but in this passage, Jesus shows us what needs to be cultivated and developed into our lives to be truly great, whether you see yourself as a leader or not. You know, leadership books call this servant leadership, right? It's a topic in so many leadership books, even the topic of leadership books, they call it servant leadership. Jesus just calls it leadership. Because to Jesus, servant leadership is synonymous with leadership. It's the whole point. It's the reason for leading, is to serve others to help others. Serving isn't something good leaders do sometimes, it's what great leaders do all the time. For most of his life, Albert Einstein had the portrait of two scientists, Newton and Maxwell, hanging on his wall as as role models to inspire him. And toward the end of his life, he took them down and he replaced them with portraits of Albert Schweitzer and Gandhi. He said that he needed new role models, not of success, but of humble service. Gandhi also said the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And he got that from Jesus. So as followers of Jesus, the the more we get to know Jesus, the more we discover about ourselves and who God created us to be. Jesus is our example. He's our role model for life. Jesus gave his life in service of others. The world says, put yourself first. Jesus says, lay down your life. The world says, focus on your dreams. Jesus says, I have plans that I created you for. The world says, give to get back. Jesus says, love your enemies. Romans 12, 1, it says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. See, the more mature we become as followers of Jesus, the more mature we become in our faith, the more worshipful we become, the more truth we start to live into, the more our lives are spent serving others. So you might be here and and maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. And we love that every Sunday there are people that come to services, that gather with us, that haven't decided yet what they believe about Christianity or what they believe about Jesus. And they're here with us exploring faith. And so I think it's important to say that we know Christians aren't the only ones who value serving others. Right? We, we, this isn't the difference between Christianity and everyone else who's serving is simply our motivation. Our greatest motivation is to love people with the love of Jesus. Our greatest motivation is to serve out of a gratitude for what God has done in our lives. 
And so that doesn't mean that we can't work together with people of all different faiths and all different backgrounds. One of our vision partners, every year we have Vision Sundays and we talk about different organizations that we partner with in the community. And one of them here locally that was founded out of our church is CityServe. And every year they have this Thanksgiving prayer breakfast where all the leaders and people in the community come together and pray. And one of the coolest parts of this prayer breakfast is seeing people from all different faith backgrounds and religions coming together because what we share in common is that we want to serve our community. And so it's a beautiful picture. Christianity isn't a holy bubble. It's a movement. And Jesus said, if someone isn't against you, they're for you. So let me ask you something. If serving is such a big deal, if it's such a big deal to Jesus, if it's such a big deal uh, in scripture and to our faith, then why don't we all serve? Or, or when it comes to serving, what gets in our way? Well, what makes serving um, that in one season maybe feels so fulfilling and then in another season it feels like a drag? Like, they put me on the schedule again? Come on. Like, I've been serving too much. No, what, what robs us of the joy of serving? Here's what I found. When serving loses its joy, it usually comes down to doing it out of the wrong thing. And so I just wanna quickly give you three joy killers of serving. In your notes, you can write this down. The first is A, when we serve out of obligation. When you serve out of obligation, like you have to, like you feel obligated or pressured to, uh, that's not the heart that God wants us to serve from. The moment we find ourselves serving out of obligation, something's off. We've lost it. And so that's a great check for you. If you're serving or you're on a serving team, the moment you find yourself like, man, I'm bummed I have to serve, like there's something going on. So this is a good heart check. Serving must overflow out of a compassion for others. God doesn't want us to be motivated out of guilt or obligation. He wants us to be motivated out of grace and gratitude. We give back from a place of gratefulness because of everything that God has given us. When we're grateful for God, we serve in his house because we want other people to experience him. When you're grateful for your family or your spouse, you serve them because you're grateful for them. How many of you know the difference? You can, you can feel the difference when someone is serving you and it's not from a place of gratitude. When it's, when it's from a place of obligation. Uh, we serve people, we serve our kids, we serve our coworkers, we serve our friends, we serve when we're grateful. When we lose our spirit of gratitude, we will eventually lose our spirit of service. If, if servings become a duty, we've lost our gratitude. Even worse, we can start to resent the thing that, that needs us or that wants us to serve, or the needs around us, we start to resent them because we're no longer grateful. The next reason we might lose our joy is when serving B is out of image control. I mean, let's be honest, serving looks good, right? It looks good in videos, it looks good on social media, it looks good in pictures. Uh, it, it, serving, it, it looks good, but when it's done with the wrong motive, it's called virtue signaling. Okay, we want to we wanna post and share and do things that make us look virtuous but aren't genuine. Uh, sometimes we're tempted to settle for a good image rather than the reward of a good impact. And sometimes when you serve and have your greatest impact, nobody knows. Nobody sees and it doesn't matter because serving's not about us. It's not about our image. It's not about looking good. It's the only, uh, according to Jesus, when we do things in public for public praise, it's the only reward we're gonna get. So serving is meant to shape our character. When we serve as an attempt to shape our image, we end up playing a character rather than our character being shaped. I mean, think about this. How sad would it be to be someone who's serving out of this desire to look good, to look like someone who serves? How sad would it be to serve, serve, serve so much for this reason and miss out on the entire benefit of just being a person? who genuinely serves that much, right? When, we, when, when we, we could actually receive something from God, see, when we serve from the right motive, our whole world gets bigger. Our whole life gets bigger because we're focusing on things beyond ourselves. The last joy killer is, see, when we serve out of our own strength, when we serve out of our own strength, this is when we use all of our energy, all, of our, all that we've got in us, and maybe it's a worthy cause, maybe it's a good thing, but when we only use our human energy and we're just trying so hard to be faithful, to be a good Christian, to be a good human, uh, this may lead to good things, but the problem is doing good without the right support 
isn't good for you. This is one of the fastest ways to burn out. We need two strengths, your strength and God's strength. To do the things that God wants you to do or asks of you or leads you to do requires a surrender to him and a recognition that I need the Holy Spirit. I need supernatural strength in my life. We need our strength and we need God's strength if it's a God-sized vision. So those are some common pitfalls of the heart when it comes to serving. Now let's take a look at greatness in action. You guys ready? Okay, you guys awake? I just feel like I need to keep like checking because you lost an hour. So how great leaders reach for greatness? How do great leaders become great? What do they know that we need to know? What is Jesus trying to show us through this example in this story, in this passage that we need to know about being great. If, you want, if we continue, look at verse 12. It says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to, this, to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Number one in your notes, um, great leaders, they reach for towels over titles. They reach for towels over titles. Um, Everyone wants a title, but few want a towel. Great leaders aren't as concerned with the prestige of a title, the privileges of a title. They don't lead for titles. They reach for towels. When Jesus went to wash his disciples' feet, He took off his robe. His robe represented his role. He wore the robe of a rabbi and a teacher. And so he takes it off because his identity isn't in his robe. His identity is in what it says in verse three. Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power. Jesus was secure as the son of God. He'd been given all authority. When we're insecure about who we are, We struggle with serving. Maybe we do it, but it's a struggle because serving, taking on the role of a servant, makes us feel less important. And when we're insecure, what do we want? We want to feel important. We want people to affirm us. We want people to affirm that we're needed and that we're important. And Jesus is showing them that though they live in a world full of symbols and and titles that say you're important or how to recognize the rabbis and the teachers and all this stuff, he's saying that's not how I do things. Did you know the title you carry doesn't determine the difference you can make? The difference you can make in people's lives, at work, in your community, at church, in your home, in your brave group, isn't determined by your title. Uh, one of my, my title is Pastor Samuel or lead pastor, and that tells you my role. That tells you my authority, but having that title does not determine my impact. H- how I care for people, serve people, who I am in relationships, how I help others succeed, these are the things that define the kind of difference I can make. You can have a title, you can be a, you can be a pastor and, have, have no, and make no difference. You, you could be a church that if it shut its doors, the community wouldn't notice, okay? Years ago, before I was in this position, I had so many different roles and titles. And I remember getting really frustrated, like just getting prideful about it, like just being really frustrated because one year I was the youth pastor, then I was the worship pastor, then I was the creative pastor, then I was the associate pastor, then I was the associate lead pastor, then I was the co-lead pastor. My title just kept changing and what was really frustrating is I didn't know how to relate to other pastors or other leaders. People didn't know how to relate to me. I mean, what's an associate lead pastor? We made that title up, (laughs) right? (laughs) Nothing really reflected what I was doing and no one understood my role or what I was contributing, but it didn't matter. God was preparing me for the role I'm in today, but the biggest part of that preparation wasn't skills, it was character. It was breaking down my pride. I found myself in rooms where people ignored me because I had a lower title or, you know, for whatever reason, at least that's what it felt like. Sometimes that was true, but for me to be secure, I had to get over it. I had to stop, I had to care a lot less about the title. Uh, let, me, let me say it like this. For me to serve, I had to get over it. Because it's not just about being secure. It's to really serve others, to be used by God, to, to really make a difference. We've got to get over 
our pride and our ego and all the stuff that wants to make serving about ourselves. Sometimes we think we need a title to be heard because we think that our value comes from being heard. Sometimes we think our value comes from people validating our thoughts and our ideas and our opinions. And what if what we really need isn't to be heard, but to listen? What if God wants us to listen? What if he wants us to ask questions, um, to, take, to take whatever seat that God has given us, to, to take that seat and own it and receive it? Um, you don't have to be in charge to make a difference. You don't have to be the decision maker to be a difference maker. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. So if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. Uh, servants prefer towels over titles because they understand that what impacts people the most is not your title, it's what you can do with a towel. It's when we get down into the messiness of someone's life, when we help them with their needs, that we start having a lasting impact. Um, to, To a hungry person, a title doesn't make a difference. To a lonely person, a title doesn't make a difference. To an insecure person, a title doesn't make a difference. To a dying person, a title doesn't make a difference. And to a truly great person, a title doesn't make a difference. All you need is a towel because a towel represents a touch. It represents a personal touch that says, I'm willing to set aside my position and roll up my sleeves and get close to your pain and get close to your problem because I'm here to serve. Verse 16, it says, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So how do great leaders reach for greatness, well, they set aside titles, they reach for towels, and great leaders also understand that number two, what they know is only as good as what they do. What they know is only as good as what they do. It's one thing to know that God wants you to serve. It's a totally different thing to do it, right? It's one thing to understand the principle, like the first shall be last, the last shall be first, the meek will inherit the earth. You can know these things, but it's another thing to put them into action. Over and over again, we see see that the path to greatness is humble service. In Luke 22, there's this story where Jesus' disciples are arguing over who's the greatest. Who's gonna be the greatest and who's gonna have the best position? Who's gonna have the best title? And Jesus hears them and he says, the kings of the world lord it over them. But you're not gonna be like that. He says, instead, the greatest among you should be the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. So think about this. Jesus doesn't say that you're great if you know something. Like outside of belief, knowing who Jesus is and believing, actively believing in him, nothing that, he, that we know, nothing that he teaches leads to greatness in our lives if we're not willing to do something with it. So you're not great by what you know, you're great if you serve. Serving is a verb. It's something that we do. It's something that we we put into action. Uh, First Samuel says obedience is better than sacrifice. I mean, think about that. We like to think about the big sacrificial moment, the big step of faith. And then in First Samuel, it says obedience is better. Just little, simple follow through. How many of you would love it if your kids kept their room clean every day instead of like doing one big thing like the dishes once a, once a month or something. You know what I mean? Like it's like the small things that add up and then God sees faithfulness. Faith without works is dead. Following Jesus isn't a statement of beliefs. It's daily actions that line up with those beliefs. And so a great way to gauge how active your faith is is how do you personally respond to needs? How do you personally respond to opportunities that come up? Like like when a need comes up in your Brave group, some of my favorite stories and testimonies around here at Brave are ways that Brave groups are meeting the needs within their Brave group and are stepping up for one another. But alternatively, you could go, you could, you could hear about a need in your Brave group and you'd go, well, did they call the church yet? Maybe call the church officer. Maybe, maybe I can refer you over here. Maybe, the, maybe this person over here can help. But you know, we, we don't just refer people. We are the church, right? Be the church. One of our church values is radical generosity. You know, radical generosity is rarely a referral. It's rarely a, about a write-off. It's rarely about, you know, a reimbursement. Radical generosity is when we see a need, 
or God gives us an idea of a way we could be a blessing in someone's life and we do something about it. It's personal, especially when it costs us something, when it requires a sacrifice. This is how we go from knowing something to becoming. When we put this humility and this heart for people into practice, doing plays a huge part in becoming. In giving, I became a giver. In, in worshiping, I became a worshiper. In leading, I became a leader. In pastoring, I became a pastor. In fathering, I became a father. In golfing, the verdict's still out. <laughs> in serving, I became a servant. So if you, were, if you were to give yourself a percentage, like if you said of 100% of all the good stuff I know, of 100% of all the stuff I've learned, maybe all the, all the scripture, all the teaching you've, you've sat under, what percent of that would you say is active in your life? What are you doing with what you know? Do you know more or are you doing more? Verse 18, I am not referring to all of you. I know those I've chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread was turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you'll believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts me Whoever, excuse me, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. This is the last point, number three. Great leaders know that their greatest success is helping others succeed. It's helping others. But it doesn't always get you a Grammy, and it's not the path of, of serving with strings attached, okay? It's not like if I do this, I'm gonna get this, and, I, and there's no expectations. The word servant used in this passage is translated from the word doulas. This is a slave, one who gives their will to another. And so when we hear the word slave, there's tension. Because in America, we think of our evil history with slavery. But what's interesting is, is we might think, oh, but it was different then when Jesus uses the word, except it wasn't because doulos referred to the people in Roman society who were treated as property and had no rights. I mean, the very definition of slavery is to have no rights, to be someone else's, someone who has no rights. Jesus took this posture. Jesus took the posture of a slave. He became what the world considered least successful so that we could be successful. I mean, he, he was carried off in chains. He was beaten beyond recognition. He was crucified. He was killed on a cross. By the world's standards, the moment he died, he had a very unsuccessful life. But God had a different plan. And God raised him up, ultimate success. God raises him up to his right hand. He became a slave to set us free. He died so that we could rise with him. So when you put aside your goals, your priorities, maybe even at the expense of your own success, well, that's when you know greatness is really coming into your life. When you give away an idea and you don't get the credit, when you leverage your resources, your connections, your network, your opportunities, when you leverage those to help someone else win instead of yourself, when, when your career takes the back burner for your spouse, when you give up for your kids or your family, when you, when you give up, when you lose time focusing on your success so that others can succeed. This goes against the entire value system that our society is built on. In fact, our society makes you feel bad when you do these things. Uh, a friend of mine, his voicemail, he's, he's like a, another uncle to me and his name is Al. He's not, our, he's not our SF campus pastor, Al. He's a different Al. This is Puerto Rican Al. <laughs> And he's, he's a character. And his, his voicemail for years has said, has said this at the end. It says, real greatness is helping others succeed. And every time I call him and hear that, I'd be like, this is the most random voicemail, right? But then this week, it like just kept popping into my head because I'm like, this is somebody who really understands greatness. And maybe, maybe he needed the reminder Maybe he wanted to be a, someone who reminds others that in a culture where that's no one's definition of greatness, this is what, he, what he's putting on his back that he's gonna live into. I mean, maybe, maybe you need it on a sticky note, maybe you need it as a screensaver, but real greatness really is every time we help someone else succeed. In an interview with author Simon Sinek, he talked about the value of serving illustrated by Navy SEALs. 
And it's really cool. He says only 10% of Navy SEALs make it through the initial training because it's so grueling, it's so hard. And so then he offers some insights. He says the guys who make it through, it's not the, the big, strong guys that look impressive. They look like they have what it takes, but they don't. It's not the guys with, that look kind of mean with tattoos and look super tough. They don't have what it takes. It's not the college-educated stars that, that look like leaders. They don't have what it takes. The ones who make it through don't necessarily look impressive at all. There may even be times in their training where they look like they're going to drop out. They look afraid. They're shivering. But at some point during the grueling, punishing training, when they're exhausted, when they're mentally spent, when they're about to quit, it doesn't look like they're going to go on. They dig deep and they find a way to help the person next to them. Success in life isn't about looking successful on the outside. It's not even about feeling successful on the inside. It's about how you can help others succeed. The mission of Brave Church is to help people find and follow Jesus. Our mission is about helping other people succeed. It's about helping people experience the love of God and find what we've found. And so that's what success looks like. I want to celebrate a few people, just a few, there are so many, but I want to celebrate some people that are just a huge part of Team Brave and are giving their lives to helping others. Um, Deborah Reck, her day job is retired. She's at our San Francisco campus, but she's a former elder and a huge administrative support to that entire campus. Josh Lamar, she's from our San Ramon campus by day. He leads a global technical support team. His serving job is a producer on Sundays. Uh, Ruben Cavetto, he's a part of Brave Music. He's, he's playing bass today. His day job is a contractor for the city of San Francisco. His serving job is bass player and music director in Brave Music. Eric Soul from Dublin, he's, his day job is an ind independent living supervisor. His serving job is usher coordinator and celebrate recovery leader. Nora Laudy from San Ramon, her day job is HR director. Her serving role is like every Brave Kids position imaginable. Preston Whitehall from, from Brave SF, his day job is software QA engineer. His serving job is pro presenter and production team. Let's just give them a hand, huh? Some of you that are new, like you're just checking things out and, they're, and you're like, man, the serving's a big deal around here. And it is. And we, we celebrate what God does through our lives to help others. And so if you're, if you're in that position, you're like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to get involved. I'm ready to serve. We, we make it super easy. The on-ramp is fast track. Welcome to Brave. We've got these classes. The next one's next Sunday. Um, for others of you, though, maybe you've been here a while and maybe this church has made a difference in your life and it's time for you to help make a difference in the lives of some other people, to go from sitting to serving, right? Jesus went from sitting to serving. So I wanna challenge you with that. I wanna challenge you to think about that, to pray about that. I know what Jesus would tell you. He'd tell you to serve, right? But unless Jesus was lying, serving is not a burden. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. So if you're new, uh, just some of the serving opportunities on Team Brave. We've got a place for everyone from greeting, ushers, hospitality, prayer team, photo team, generosity, production, kids, parking and safety. You can lead a Brave group. You can join a band. There's a whole bunch of opportunities. All you need to do is talk to somebody that, that you know that's already serving. How can I get involved? Talk to one of our staff or campus pastors. And so today, you know, we talked about what it means to be great. We talked about how to reach for your greatness. And Jesus modeled this by serving. He modeled this by washing feet. As we close, I want to leave you with, with one more thought. Um, you know, some of you don't feel qualified. You don't feel qualified maybe because of some decisions you've made, some mistakes in your life, some stuff in your past. You might not feel like you have something to give to others, like, like you have the ability to serve. In Greco-Roman culture, hands and feet symbolize the part of our lives where your actions came from. And so what's really powerful in this moment as Jesus is washing their feet is he is also making a statement. He's saying, you know what? I am gonna wash away. I am going to forgive you of all the things you've done in your past, present, and even in the future that might make you feel disqualified from serving. 
Only Jesus can qualify us. You know, I just imagine these disciples, you know, one day they would carry some significant titles. They'd be apostles and leaders and teachers. But here they are in this moment. They're unqualified. Their master, their leader is washing their feet. And I can only imagine there'd be days where either end of the spectrum, one day they feel kind of overqualified, like, look at what we've accomplished. Like, Jesus only served in Israel, but we took the movement global, (laughs) right? Look at all we've done since he left. Or on the other side, they might found themselves in a day where they made a mistake. They saw the truth of their flesh, the reality of their, 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 their humanness, their brokenness. They might have felt overqualified. They might have felt underqualified. But either way, the image they would come back to is Jesus washing their feet. And when he does this, he washes it all away. He washes our sin away, past, present, and future. He, he is the only one that qualifies us. And so Jesus could make them great, and he wants to make you great. He wants to help all of us do great things, great things defined as being a blessing to others. Jesus has plans for your life. He has plans to be a tremendous blessing to the world around you. And so the moment you're ready to take the focus off of yourself, because it's pride, it takes us in either direction. Pride makes us feel way overvaluable. And pride makes us feel way undervaluable. And Jesus says, no, let's bring it right back here. And let's just focus on, let's take the focus off of you and let's focus on other people. And that's one of the beauty, most beautiful things of serving is it takes us beyond ourselves. When God sees someone that's willing to commit to this action, to commit to humble service, God sees someone that he can use to be a huge blessing in the lives of other people. I think it's so beautiful how God uses the weak. He uses our weakness. He uses the weak. He uses the young. He uses children. Just yesterday, I was getting excited for Easter, and I was talking to Mia, our four-year-old, and I was, I was like giving her the full pitch I was like, there's gonna be this many Easter eggs. They're they're gonna be filled with candy. The Easter, I was just getting her hyped. And and then she was like writing on this this little tablet thing and like writing some stuff. And she can't write, like she's just scribbling. But I'm like, what are you writing? And she's like, I'm writing down some names. I'm like, what for? And she's like, people I'm gonna invite. Because at a young age, we teach kids when there's a party, when you have a birthday, you make a list. Who are you gonna invite, right? When, When there's a party at your house, we... We, write the, we, we figure out who we're going to invite. And so when Jesus throws a party, guess who he invites? Everyone. My wife came home from a birthday party and that her and Mia went to, and she said, yeah, um, did you tell Mia to invite all the other kids to Easter? And I was like, I should have. <laughs> she did it on her own. There's something beautiful about that. Just the childlike desire to include and invite and to want others to experience the thing that we're excited about, that we know is gonna be so good in our lives. I wonder, when was the last time that you played a part in someone coming to Jesus? When was the last time that maybe you shared your faith or maybe you just invited someone to church? What if you invited someone to Easter? What if you invited someone next Sunday? When we wash the feet of others, What does that look like? I think the first responsibility, if I was gonna think, what's the the first responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus? The moment we've become a Christian, the moment that we've received all that God has given us, if we really take that in, the very first responsibility we have next is to want that for other people, amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. God, I pray right now that you would just, (laughs) that you would just, Fill us with joy for what could be in our lives as we give our lives away, as we serve you. God, I pray that that we would truly see the burden as a blessing, that we would be moved to action, that it wouldn't just stay as something we know, but that we'd take those steps of becoming great, becoming humble servants in your name. And God, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? Let's worship.